Welcome to Issues and Answers with your host, Diane Kinderwater. Issues and Answers is presented as a public service to inform, educate, and better the lives of New Mexicans. And now, Issues and Answers with your host, Diane Kinderwater. Welcome to the program. I'm Diane Kinderwater. Thanks for being a part of the program. If you've seen our other shows, you know, oh, they're doing a lot of candidates. Yes, we've invited many candidates who are running for state senate here in Bernalillo County, touching Bernalillo County, to be guests of our program. And we've invited uh, both the Republican and the Democrat. And if there's an independent running, we invited them as well. Those who've accepted our invitations are, of course, on our show. On program today, we're going to talk to a candidate running for state senate who is going to be in this legislature hoping to advocate for the rights and interests of law enforcement. We don't hear that too often, so we're going to find out why um, Why Rudy Mora, who's a Republican, 28 years serving our community. We thank him for that, for being a law enforcement officer, state police, Laguna, under, uh, under, uh, under sheriff for Bernalillo County for all of his service. So we're going to find out why now Rudy Mora would like to run for the Senate to represent us. We'll be back with Rudy right after this. Stay with us. We're invited, we're, we've invited candidates, those who have accepted our part of our program, and Rudy Mora is running for Senate District 10, and you're going to share where that is, but thank you so much for being part of the program and for accepting our invitation. Thank you for having me. So, District 10, you want to run and be in the legislature after 28 years in law enforcement. Why the heck would you like to do that? I guess some people have told me I'm a glutton for punishment, <laughs> but you know, it's, I have a passion to serve. Um, it's been in our family history. My great-grandfather on my father's side, uh, Filomeno Mora, was a probate judge in 1910. You know, my, um, my grandfather on my mother's side was a crossing guard for Bernalillo County and was killed in the line of duty in 1968. Um, so it's just been a passion of ours to serve. My, son, my uncle Santos Baca was a chief deputy with the Bernalillo County Sheriff in the 70s. And, you know, it's just I have a passion to serve. I have a servant uh, mindset, and that's what I want to do. You've been 20 years with the state police, retired yes. from them. Then you went on to be, the well, you were the undersheriff for Bernalillo County as well as the police chief for Laguna, Pueblo of Laguna. Yes. You know, and in, in that time frame, you know, I've kind of specialized with uh, highway criminal enforcement with canine, uh, border security. Um, so a lot of my time, I've also spent adjunct instructor with New Mexico Tech with their border security program for almost 12 years, and uh, where we... Uh, taught law enforcement officers along the southwest border, uh, smuggling techniques and how to battle the, the border issues that we face. Uh, and now I currently do that as an adjunct instructor for Sandia Labs as an adjunct instructor uh, in the West Balkans, so along Serbia, Bosnia, Morocco, and same, same struggles we face here in America, you know, I'm helping out in those countries as well. Have you traveled to those countries? Yes, yes I have. Yes. And what do you do? What, how, are the, how are their borders and their problems different than ours? Well, it's all the same, right? You know, the, uh, you know they, everybody wants to protect their borders. They're trying to protect their people. And over there, it's, you know, it's still the same, lots of drugs. But over there, there's a big uh, nuclear and radiation threat. So where we're not seeing that, hopefully not here in the U.S., you see that uh, as a huge concern in, the, in Europe and in the West Balkans. Um, so that's one area where the federal government's able to provide them with uh, radiation uh, nuclear uh, vans that they park at their port of entry. And these vans are able to pick up uh, radiation signals. And at, at that point, then the vehicles get secondaried and then we teach them how to search a vehicle and look for this contraband that's likely concealed in, in the vehicles that are going through their checkpoints. That's what you have done in Europe yeah. Yep. And in here in the United States. So what's going on here in the United States? Really? Well, well, you know, it's uh, it's 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 eye opening. You know, things haven't changed. Our FBI director here uh, in New Mexico has recently said that open border is a major driver of crime in New Mexico. And, and I firmly believe that I've seen that where uh, over the years, and we saw this 10 years ago, we call it uh, junior narcos, where the, the younger uh, Mexicans are, were being influenced by the older narcos and the flashy life, the gold chains, the fancy cars, the women. 
And we saw that problem coming with youth violence, what we're seeing here now, probably 10 years ago, because it was already happening in Mexico. The youth violence, as you say, Rudy Mori, has just sprung up. I mean, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds charged with murder here. Yes. And you're saying that's been happening in Mexico 10 years ago. Oh, and for, for years. And, and the cartels that are good at, at cultivating their people, right? And that's why they... They recruit their sicarios, their assassins, at anywhere from 8 to 12, 13 years old. And, you know, during my research along the Mexican border, I've had the opportunity to interview with uh, assassins, and they flat out told me that their first person that they assassinated, they were 10 years old. And the know, assassin was 10 years old. 10 years old. and Given a gun, trained to shoot someone else at yeah. 10 years. Yes, and the, and the folks that we were involved with, the psychologist, said, you know, it's, it's an idea. It's where the mind, the, the juvenile mind is not completely developed. They don't understand what they're doing. And when I was talking to this individual, he told me flat out, he goes, it, it didn't bother me. It was like I was playing a video game. And he goes, now as I'm older, I've realized, like, uh, now I have to face my consequences, right, for all the people that he's... Um, He's killed. So, you know, and that's what we're seeing now is the, and there's a lot of bis, big misconception, in my opinion, about when it comes to cartels. Well, you hear the news media often say the cartels are here. Well, uh, tentacles of the cartels are here, but the main cartel leaders very rarely leave their, their comfort zone. You know, we just saw the two major leaders of the Sinaloa cartel turn themselves in, right, here in New Mexico. And you know, it's just one of those things where you have... Car wait, wait, did they turn themselves in or were they caught? Or were we talking about... They, they turned themselves in from the information I'm getting. You know, and it's, it's one of those things where we saw this with uh, Chapo Guzman, th their father, right? When he was captured and was going to get captured in Mexico, um, he had an agreement with the Mexican government to turn himself in, but yet, as a Sinaloan cartel leader, he built the prison that he was going to stay in. So it was a luxury, literally a luxury hotel, right? But and then, I mean, okay, I diverted from that. Yeah. So you've seen this, the training, the psych psychology, they're training these young assassins. Yep. And what is your whole point about what's happening then in New Mexico? What's happening here in New Mexico is, again, it's just that, that junior narco culture where they see the limelight of, of, of just being a, a, a criminal and, and being, um, you know, cultivated into that environment and they're sensationalizing that that's a good thing to be doing. And, and it's just, um, it's wrong. We need to be better for our children. Do we feel that New Mexicans don't believe that's happening? I, or legislators don't believe that's happening? I think uh, the messaging that we get doesn't always necessarily give the full story. And uh, I can just go off my personal experience, you know, I wish the news media was more factual in what they do. Uh, I, I, I have a ton of respect for the news media and I believe what they do is important, but I think they need to live their life like I live my life. We, we don't have to be bad to get better. And I think in being able to project both sides of a story is crucial, right? And not just a, a very skewed, hyper-sensationalized uh, story. And um, so I think that plays a, a critical role. We're getting back to your Senate seat okay. that you'd like, but <clears throat> regarding the border, what could you as a state senator do regarding the safety of our border? Well, what we could do is we can, the Republicans have already introduced a bill this last special session that wasn't even heard, and it was being able to, uh, it was a very complex bill, but being able to finish the border that the Trump administration of the wall. We have a, a small portion of wall that hasn't been completed in Santa Teresa. It's probably less than a mile. The, the panels are sitting there on the side. I've been there, I visited the site, and li literally the immigrants just walk right around the wall. And uh, I know some law enforcement down there, and they recently told me that they're having to, during the summer, they were having to protect the free lunch program at Santa Teresa Elementary School because the cafeteria workers came in one day and the migrants raided the, the kids' free lunch program. And that, as a New Mexican, infuriates me because well, you and I both know that sometimes that's the only meal those children will get. And, um, and so, 
you know, you won't ever see that in mainstream media. But those are that's the real life things that are happening along the southwest border. When you speak about money to complete it, you're talking about federal dollars. Yes, federal dollars in and, and in even state dollars to finish it. Just like Texas, you know, this administration has proven at the national level that um, the border isn't a priority until recently for them, in my opinion. Until the election. Until the election, right? And, and that's another reason why I'm running. I'm not your typical politician, you know, um, but I, I'm a problem solver, you know. As a police officer, people were calling me when they were in their worst situations, you know, and I'm getting dispatched there, trying to help them out in their worst possible things that have happened to them. So it's something that I've done my whole career, and it's one of those things where we can do, be better, just like what Texas had, you know, did in Shelby Park. I went and visited there this past summer. What did they do? Well, that's where they were doing their processing center, and all the migrants had overtaken Shelby Park. And again, if you're familiar with Shelby Park, it's a beautiful place along the Rio Grande River where high school kids play golf. And the migrants took over that area, and the feds were not helping them out at all. So the Texas Governor Abbott went in and said, we're going to do this, and we're going to secure our border with the National Guard. So, and I was able to go down with a delegation of Senate Republicans and some other concerned uh, citizens, and we, we toured that southwest border and saw the successes that they have. And, so uh, what could we do with our border? Well, you know what, we can, need to secure it. If the feds aren't going to help us, we need to go in there. We have the ability with the National Guard to go down there. Uh, during <clears throat> several administrations that I worked under with the state police, we had Operation Stone Garden working down there where we were working collaboratively with the Border Patrol, uh, state and locals the, down there of, with the high intensity drug trafficking areas, sheriffs, police departments, and we're all working together to secure our border and combat. But the, we're not doing that now. Uh, to my knowledge, not National in Guard. an effective way, right? I've when, National Guard down there. You know, when you have good friends of mine that are Border Patrol agents that are literally just processing asylees and, um, and quite frankly, offer them when they come in, they get their information, they give them a phone, a free phone, uh, the immigrants call this um, an Obama phone, and then they, because they've been giving them since that, his administration, and they give them a prepaid debit card of $2,000 to, to you know, hold them down. And that's where people don't understand the full story. They're like, oh yeah, we're giving this humanitarian effort to help them, but they don't realize that the drug trafficker, the coyote, the, the, the mule that's crossing them, is getting that money and the car, it's, that money is going back to the cartel. So it's really not helping these individuals. They're being extorted, they're being trafficked, plain and simple. And these folks have one or two choices. They can either be trafficked through sex, they could be tra trafficked and extorted by extorting their family members back home, and then they can either start to smuggle drugs so they can pay off their debt to the cartel for crossing them across the border. When they're coming across the border, I mean, they, well, through the river, what happens to them? Well, once they once they cross, you know, they can just make it to uh, a, legally should be able to go to a port of entry and, and claim asyl asylum. The problem is that these individuals are not asylees, right? They're but they're being trained by the cartels to answer all the correct questions, so they fit the criteria for being okay. an asylee. And if then they're the, here for asylum, what happens to them? At that point, they're given, they're documented, they're given uh, the phone, the debit card. Or the, and they're allowed in. And they're allowed in. And then they're given a court date, which sometimes we, we've seen these cases go on for 10 years. And, and that's what's frustrating for me, even as a small businessman. My wife and I have owned a small business for 28 years. They're allowing these folks in with no ability to work. Like, you know, the process is just... That's an asylum. Yeah. But now they're answering yeah. as... But if they cross the river, what happens? To them? If they just cross illegally, then they just they blend in, right? And they're gonna they're gonna either work in the underground, they're gonna be involved in drugs, they're gonna be involved in crime, they're gonna be involved in, in trafficking, and you know so much. You know, years ago, you saw a lot of people from Mexico literally crossing the border to just make a better life for themselves. But what we've seen and what has been documented is people from Venezuela, they're, they're emptying their prisons with, and their mental institutions because they don't want them there. And guess what? They're coming to United States of America. And that's what, it's been documented. Several of these individuals have even killed people and raped people across our country. At what point are we gonna start defending our people and being responsible for the people? And that's what- Did you what, say in Sacramento? Yeah. Rudy, 
I was asking a lot about the border, but a lot of people feel that the drugs that are coming in the fentanyl are coming through our border. Correct. And it's very dangerous. That's why we're spending some time. You as a state senator representing District 10, uh, what other issues, and I think I mentioned at the beginning of the program, an advocate for the rights and interests of law enforcement. That's what you'd like to do. Um, we see in the national media oftentimes, uh, quote unquote, abuse of police officers. That's what makes the headlines. That's what makes the shocking that some officers take their power beyond what they're the civil rights of the individual. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's one of those things, there's a lot of concerns in Senate District 10 as I'm talking to individuals. I, I've knocked and talked to, to a lot of people, knocked their doors, talking to them, and I don't care whether they're Republican, Democrat, I don't care. I wanna to talk to people, I want because that's who the folks I'm on, I wanna represent. And their issues are crime, the economy, our border, our healthcare system. And in my opinion, my experience brings a very unique perspective to the state Senate. If elected this November, which I plan to be, I'll be probably the only state senator that has law enforcement boots on the ground experience. And it's, it's, I shouldn't say it's sad to say, but I truly believe that our legislature should be representative of the community they serve. Well, the fact of the matter is the vast majority of our state's legislators are attorneys. And um, again, I'm not knocking an attorney. Everybody and a has lot a, of de defense attorneys. Yes, and it's just one of those things that's, I'm not sure their interests are community, community uh, and, you know, and that's why I'm running. But if in order for us to solve the uh, crime, economy, uh, education, uh, our, everything that people are concerned about, it comes with law and order. If we can't establish law and order, people don't feel safe to go to the grocery store. People are having to raise their prices because of theft. You know, the list the goes businesses, on. The businesses, the businesses. And down to our children, if children are struggling because they're hearing gunshots and, and they're trying to do their homework or they're worrying about migrants taking their free lunch program. You know, those are things we need to be concerned about. So you, someone who's worked in law enforcement for 28 years, believe it starts with a civilized society needs to have law and order. 100%. And then back to but what, what you... What are you going to bring to the legislature if you're elected? Of course, you're a law and order person. What, <laughs> I, what, I'm, what I'm aiming to do is to change the view of law enforcement. The fact of the matter is I'm very active with the Fraternal Order of Police on a national level. And, and the numbers, I'm... All, I'm as of last week, 233 police officers were shot in the line of duty. That's shocking in, in just a half a year. We're in a record uh, pace to pass that. But you don't see that on mainstream media. You'll just see that one incident of misconduct. And I'm here to tell you as a veteran law enforcement, no one, and I mean no one, hates a bad cop more than a good cop. And, that, and I believe that 100%. And it's one of those things that there's a lot of things we can do. And one, thing, one of the things that I can do is change the, the perception of law enforcement day by day, right? Because the men and women of law enforcement right now are going out there and they're working hard and they're being, everything they do is being viewed by a mic, mic, under a microscope. Uh, I'll give you an example here. I have a friend of mine, I won't mention the agency, but he works here in the metro area went out and, and did uh, an operation where he stopped a stolen vehicle, uh, crashed the vehicle, the bad guy crashed the vehicle, he took off running, he captured this guy. This person had five outstanding felony warrants from aggravated battery with a deadly weapon, you name it, bad guy out in the streets, right? This officer, long story short, took 40 hours suspension for not activating his body camera in time. Well, this guy spent less than 12 hours in jail and was released the next day. Give so, me those numbers again, Rudy Mora. Uh, so 40 hours suspension, and the bad guy spent 12 hours in jail before a, drug, a judge released him again. So you tell me that that's not a gut punch to someone out there that took an oath to protect and serve us and made a, a, a simple mistake, like, you know, I make mistakes every single day. They're just not under a microscope where people are trying to take money out of my pocket. You know, I just learn from my mistakes and I want to move on. And so do these officers. So I believe that this is a, a top-down approach in leadership where leadership just sometimes just needs to stand their ground and say, you know what, officers make mistakes. I'm going to hold them accountable and take full responsibility. You know, as a, as a police chief, as a sheriff, say, you know what, this is my agency. 
this is eye-opening to me because a lot of the things that we see going out there resorts back to things that I can do as a legislature. Appropriate money for better training, better uh, officer wellness, quality of life issues, right? As a police officer, I saw things that you should never see in your entire lifetime. That I, I close my eyes sometimes and I cringe, you know? And uh, if I was fortunate that I've beat a lot of odds. One, I'm still married to my high school sweetheart, you know, 32 years. Congratulations. Well, thank you, thank you. She's been a, a critical component in my success, in our family's success. Wow. And just and to, the fact that you recognize that, that's terrific. No, it's 100% true. I, I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. And it's because, wow. you know, I was able to go as a young state policeman. I, I remember an incident on I-40 where a two-year-old had been killed in a traffic accident. And I pulled up to this car, it's mid-July 1993 along I-40 near through New Mexico, and I see the car overturned, the radiator uh, steam is billowing in the air, and I see this lady holding her baby, and she's crying, and she's holding her baby, and she's talking in Spanish, and she said, my son wanted to get out of the car seat, so I took him out, because he was crying. And, uh, and she goes, now I'm gonna cry for the rest of my life. Oh. You know, um, and, and those are things that punch me in the gut as a law enforcement officer because, you know, no one ever sees that, no. that, that I'm, I'm carrying that after all these years. But wow. I was fortunate enough to go back home and hug my own two-year-old yeah. son yeah. and have my wife pat me on the back and say, you know what, this is going to be all right. And that's where we need to be better as a society in understanding and supporting police officers because I'm yes. telling you, police officers go out there every single day and they make positive police experiences amongst the community, but no one ever hears about it. But God forbid they forget to turn on their body camera and they're gonna take a 40 hour suspension. Um, something's gotta change there. You know, um, you know I'm all for, for accountability and personal accountability. Another issue is that we see over, this, over the years that I've been frustrated with, with the State Law Enforcement Academy was the LEA 90. It's, uh, that's the, the form called for misconduct for police officers. So as a police chief, as an undersheriff, if we had someone that committed an act of moral turpitude in law enforcement, we would submit that to the Law Enforcement Academy Board and they would review it for their certification. But what's happened over the years, and, and it's slowly changing, um, but over the many, many years, you're seeing that LEA 90 being used as a bargaining chip. So say you, I go to you as my police chief, you say, Rudy, you know, I'm gonna terminate you, you can either resign or be fired, and, but if you resign, and I don't have to terminate you, I won't submit your LEA 90, which means I can keep my certification, I go and then I just go on to the next agency, right? And, they, and the police chiefs are doing that, not to fault them, it's just a, it's a, it's a broken system. It's a systematic problem over the years where we talk about dollars, right? The root of all evil, controlling. If I can control this uh, lawsuit by an officer not suing us, letting them keep the certification, let wow, the other agency boy, do that it. that goes deep, Rudy, something that you don't hear about. No, you don't. So you're able to bring the leg to the legislature. Again, you possibly could be the only law enforcement person Correct. elected to the state legislature. Yes. House and Senate. Yes, there's a, there's wow. a couple others running on the House side uh, that are former law enforcement. But another issue that we need to uh, quickly address is this revolving door, right? In 2016, us taxpayers, we passed this constitutional amendment on bail reform, and it's a complete failure. Let's face it, it's a complete failure. And, and they've tried to pass, they've tried to correct it, but they haven't been able to yeah, correct it. Yeah, and you know, and at the end of the day, we really need to look at our judges and really uh, hold them accountable for what they're doing. You know, and, and even to the point where we look at their system and how they're, once they're elected, then at that point, oh, we either retain them or we, or we don't. I, I very rarely hear of any judge not being retained, right? And so it's just one of those things I encourage people to do their research, whether you vote for me or you vote for my opponent, look and do your research on these individuals, look and do your research on your judges when you're looking to retain them. And all that information is public record. Just How can they find information they about you, Rudy Moore? About me, they can look at uh, www.rudybmora, the number four, newmexico.com. Rudy B. Mora, Mora number four, four. nm.com. 
www.ghostbusiness.com. What will they find in your webpage? Well, what they'll find is that I'm a, a lifelong resident of New Mexico, been born and raised here on the west side of Albuquerque. I'm a product of our public school system. Um, I believe in helping people, you know, and uh, you'll just find out I'm a down-to-earth, common-sense guy. You know, I, uh, I believe in, in solving crime. Uh, you know, as a young uh, adult, you know, I was 17 years old and I was a victim of violent crime. I was shot in the chest in, in my junior, my summer of my junior, junior year on a random act of violence. So um, I almost lost my life, and I was immediately at a young age exposed to a system almost 30 years ago, right? Over 30 years ago, where it wasn't a victim-centric approach to solving crime. You know, here I am, I almost lost my life, and the person that shot me got six months in the city county jail with work release. Even 30 years ago? Even 30 years they ago. They didn't even pay attention they to the They didn't even pay attention. So what could you do? We've got 30 seconds. What could you do sitting in the legislature, bringing that to light? Is to create policies that, have, that include the victims. You know, oftentimes, and we see it all the time, victims are left out of the equation of solving crime. And we're never going to completely solve crime holistically if we don't involve the victims. And we know that it's, it's heartbreaking for a police officer to do their job completely and then to hand it out to the uh, prosecutor and then to the judges and have it fall apart. Yes, 100%. That's I, discouraging. I've said this my whole career, and this is something we need to change as a society, as a criminal justice system. We fight organized crime with unorganized law enforcement and unorganized, unorganized policymakers. And that's heartbreaking to you. Yes. Thank you for your service to the state. You're and welcome. You see crime, it's breaking your heart to see what's going on in our community now. Oh, absolutely. You know, and, and I'm all for uh, rehabilitation, diversion programs. I have been involved in those types of programs. But what we fail society is that those diversion programs don't hold them accountable. If they're assigned to a 30-day treatment program, well, they show up for one day and then they're back out on the street self-medicating. If they don't show up to those programs, they need to go back to jail you know, where we can do mandated treatment, you know. Now, if they finish their, their treatment, good for them. But we have to have consequences because right now there's no consequences. Well, the consequences are we, we feel it. We are afraid to go out on the streets. Yes, That's ex the consequences. exactly. Rudy Mora, thank you again for your service, your dedication to the state. You want to keep going. Oh, you know, I do. Me. You know, I. You want to keep going and doing it. You know, God bless uh, America. God bless New, uh, New Mexico. We live in the greatest place in the world, in my opinion. You know, here in a, in a couple of months, we'll have all these balloons flying over our beautiful city. You know, I love this place. And you want to keep it as lovely as it can be. Yes, you know, have grandkids. we got to make it better for them. Thanks, Rudy Mora. District 10 here in Albuquerque running for the New Mexico State Senate. Uh, remember, election day is coming up November 5th. I'm Diane Kinderwater. Make it a great week with your family. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Issues and Answers with your host Diane Kinnewater is presented as a public service to inform, educate, and better the lives of New Mexicans. To comment on today's program or to purchase a copy of any Issues and Answers program, visit sunbroadcasting.org or call us at 505-345-1991.